bitter ending, but thanks for the music, Francesca. Um, welcome everyone tonight to the second Greater Than talk. Um, Thriving Networks, the money problem is what we're calling it. Last week we had the talk Freelancers Against Precarity, um, and I'll just drop the YouTube link into the chat for those of you who missed it. Um, and tonight we're kind of deepening um, some of the subjects we talked about um, last week, but also going further into this question, money in communities and networks. So we're really lucky to have with us tonight, um, Alicia Tupat, who's from WeShare and also an associate at Greater Than, as well as Francesca Pick, um, founding partner of Greater Than, and super stoked to have Alicia Wright on board with us um, as our special guest. And Alicia is Director of Partnerships and Community at Open Collective, where she supports open source business models um, and getting a bit more sustainable. And Open Collective is on an amazing mission to help collaborative groups collect and spend money transparency, transparently. And as many of you in the audience will know, there are so many types of projects, not just open source projects, but neighborhood associations, clubs, unions, social movements, not-for-profits. And many of them are forced to use a physical glass jar, asking a sponsor to directly pay for their expenses or front the big overhead of setting up and managing a not-for-profit or a corporation. So this is what Open Collective uh, are solving. They enable groups to quickly set up a collective, raise funds and manage them transparently. And previously, Elisa had worked on Open Impact at the World Bank, Bloomberg Philanthropies and Samsung Next. And I don't know if you can just put the URL to Open Collective in the chat, that would be excellent. So well, I started with intros and now I'll do a very quick bit of housekeeping. My name is Kate Beecroft. I'm also part of Greater Than, um, where I specialize in helping grow ecosystems, um, not biological ones, ecosystems of business, uh, communities, etc. cetera. Um, and tonight we, we have you all on mute, I'm pretty sure. I don't know if you can unmute yourself, so we've crossed out that bit of housekeeping. Um, we, we love to see your faces and I can see lots of faces already, the smiling Jorium, um, Adrian, obviously <laughs> Marge there supporting us, hi. <laughs> and if you do wanna have your video on that, super cool. This um, video is being recorded and it will go on YouTube um, tomorrow. Um, pop questions in into the chat as we go and we will either pick them up um, and just answer them immediately or we'll save them to the end of the call and go deeper with our speakers. Um, and at the end, if you want to stay and chat a bit a bit more, we'll keep the room open and just stay behind and we'll have we can have a bit more of a conversation. Um, so yeah, just to quickly introduce the topic a, a little bit more before I pass over to the speakers. Um, I'm assuming that many of you tonight, if not everyone, is in a community or a purpose network, or even a collective of freelancers. And if so chances are you would have experienced um, conflict or problems or anxiety around money and value exchange. And it is super important that we get better about this, these money um, and resource problems, as many of these new movements are really changing the notion of how unequal and extractive structures of society and, and the power that they have, as well as traditional organizations. But to become truly viable um, as alternative organizing models, these kind of lighter touch structures need to develop better ways of dealing with questions of money, power, and value flow, which we see often breaking even the most inspiring community. And these reasons are not just superficial, i.e., well, it's because we live in this ultra capitalist society and people are just programmed to seek the most money possible. It's just, these, are, these are misleading and easy reasons when in actual fact, what money and value mean to us can be, can be really complex. Um, so from our experience, the four of us um, working in networks and communities for over a decade and with Alicia's perspective, um, we wanna just start to unpick some of these things tonight and that includes 
maintaining motivation and energy amongst network community members, enabling highly and less active community uh, members to share workload and power, the tension between volunteer and paid work, free riding, burnout of core members, mismanagement of funds and conflicts around money. We won't be able to address everything. We'll, excuse me. <coughs> Sorry about that. We'll go um, slightly deep. So I'll just pass over to the speakers. Why is this question of money and value flow so important to you? I'll start with you, Fran. Thanks, Kate, and great to see so many people interested in this topic, uh, one that I'm always been very passionate about. Um, yeah, so why is this important to me? Uh, I've been working in a bunch of different networks and communities for many years now, and uh, specifically in the WeShare network. Uh, that was when I sort of started for the first time, ending up in this role of becoming the person who's managing the budget. And uh, that was a very challenging role and one that I found quite um, like uh, encountered a lot of contradictions within uh, because in WeShare almost everything we were doing we were trying to be as open and participatory as possible about everything and it just seemed like that rule no longer held true at all when it came to the budget not because people didn't want to but that somehow it just wasn't what was happening and that just basically very few people had any understanding at all of the budget and I sort of found myself with uh, a lot more power than I really felt comfortable with, um, with this you know, little spreadsheet going through numbers. And uh, yeah, that really made me think, um, how is it possible that somehow there isn't this collective awareness uh, for what it actually means to be having this budget and these little micro decisions that could have a big impact. So that really is what got me on my path to, to wanting to think about how to make um, budgeting and money questions and decisions more accessible and something that is easier to bring many people into. So that's really what got me into this and, and why I feel like it's so important because um, I'm really a doer and I'm interested in things manifesting and really happening. And for that, you always uh, are going to need money at some point, at least often, or some kind of value exchange. And so that's something that I just want to become much easier for, for all types of groups to get access to. Great, thanks Fran. Alyssa, welcome to the call. What is enlivening about this question for you? Uh, yes, and thank you. I mean, this is a really exciting conversation. I had the opportunity to listen to the first um, uh, call and uh, so many things that really resonate uh, for me. Um, and so I'm like to meet you all um, and to learn from you. Um, as uh, Kate was saying, I am responsible for community and growth at Open Source Collective. And we provide, uh, and we'll, get, I suppose, get into this more, the, the legal and fiscal infrastructure for um, open source projects. Um, I'm also on the board of Open Collective Foundation. I acknowledge there are lots of open and collective in these words, but fundamentally this one, the foundation, um, provides the legal and fiscal infrastructure for uh, more charitable projects. And, and both are designed to be like, to um, sort of lower the friction of the administration, administrative costs of um, projects doing what they sought out to do. So we kind of collaboratively create platforms and communities so that um, you are able to do um, all of the legal compliance and you know fiscal reporting in um, in in appropriate country specific legal ways and get your work done. So um, we see that um, this challenge around um, uh, fiscal and legal. Uh, infrastructure, um, a, it, we see it as a challenge for organizations to get what they um, would like to get done, um, accomplished. And for me, like why I'm interested, I mean, I never thought that I would be um, going through vendor portals or uh, spending time on spreadsheets or, you know, working in this administrative space. But part of the, uh, why I've gravitated here is that I think 
many of our current um, frameworks for economic su success um, and, um, and security are, are broken. Um, and that much of the uh, collaborative um, processes that we've like kind of tested out and proven when it comes to technology innovation um, have not been applied yet to um, how, how what business and business success um, can look like. And so um, what's, what's powerful about um, what we do at Open Source Collective is that we work, um, we work in collaboration. Um, we work with projects that are um, designed to uh, build and innovate in, in collective spaces. So that it, it, in a way that's not kind of uh, based on VC funding, but instead based on um, collaborative support so that, um, uh, so that through collaboration, like we can find like business uh, and success. I hope that kind of yeah, I hope that makes some sense and that I'm able to continue to like refine all the nuances in that. But I come from a startup space uh, where VC funding is uh, a lot of the, the journey towards um, economic security and success. And I can't tell you how many times, um, you know, somebody starts a company with, with uh, great intention and then that, um, that, uh, that we, they pivot <laughs> towards something um, where where mission uh, seems second to um, economic success. I think to to find um, equality uh, across uh, difference, like geographic difference, um, gender difference, we have to find like ways to find um, business uh, methods that are um, inclusive and collective to all. I hope that's something. Thank you. That's amazing. And yeah, um, many groups around the world are uh, relying on Open Collective. So it's already doing so much to enable some of these projects to exist and not have to worry all the time about, you know, going through the heavy paperwork. So congrats on the work so far. Alicia. Yes, thank you, Kate. Um, so for me, um, my background before getting deeply into WeShare, which is the network I'm mostly active in in the moment together with uh, Greater Than, uh, was in uh, new, econo new economic movements. Uh, one of them was uh, the economy for the common good. And I came actually in WeShare, having a look at um, the sharing economy uh, models from, from that time. And um, so that's where I was coming from and also with a high interest in the whole like feminist economy and the whole care economy. So in those, uh, with those systemic lenses, then I started to see, oh, actually it's possible to define, let's say the frameworks in a different way. And the question then is like, you can value different things. That's the theory of these movements. And so the question opened up for me is like, what do you value? So what do you want to value in the system that you want to create? And then the question that I hold, though, is then, OK, once you have defined that, is like, how do you make that possible in your own um, community organization network in uh, which you are still embedded in a system that has these other incentives uh, against which you're trying to design? So as I said, this is still a question that I um, hold and um, that I have seen yeah, different, trying different things. And um, and then based on that, for example, to link to uh, Fran's point, um, there is like, I was never as deep in the WeShare budget as she was, but like we have like, let's say like a common pot from the international WeShare, like gl global ops. And I realized for myself, like I was not aware of it for, for years. And at some point it's like, oh, you know, this is the most important thing now. But then it's like how, I understand that those people that are yeah, never having a look at it or not knowing what it is and, and not having the access to the, to the finances. So that's um, one of the things. Um, and then on the other hand, also when it was like very centralized and you have these ideas of a different system with different incentive system, but still um, money is very centralized and that creates a lot of tensions around power. So um, yeah, that's why it, um, it interests me because I think it changes everything what you value. Uh, but then the big question, how do you do that in the current um, context that we find ourselves in? Yeah, I expect the answers by the end of the call, Alicia. So. <laughs> but 
what in in the work you're the three of you are doing um working with many many networks and communities and, and movements and even early stage startups what are some of the the patterns and the trends that you're seeing um in, in this question of, of money and value flow problems opportunities challenges um, and feel free to take your mics off speakers and we can just um be a bit more organic if in our flow if there's a point of a, another speaker that, that you really like jump on it yeah, I'll I jump on maybe... this one. Yeah, go ahead, Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> go, Alyssa. Um, so s some trends uh, that I've been seeing from, from my journey um, and just reading the news, I suppose. Um, I think that there is, if we, if we take a, a step back, I think that there is a trend towards, um, uh, uh, a trend sort, what did I, I wrote it up as, um, hmm. Well, can't find the word in my notes, but I will just say that there is a um, there is a, a trend where people do not trust um, government institutions or um, or uh, even kind of tech, tech capitalist like frameworks. Um, I think that's why we see some. Uh, I think uh, I see like sort of a spectrum that people are either um, innovating or uh, congregating in places that are complete like, like anti-political uh, institutions and, and, um, and business frameworks. And so um, a, a trend that I'm seeing is that there are others, um, I would say everybody here who is looking for, um, looking for tools and frameworks where it's not a rejection of all of, um, of, of, the, of these, um, this this work, but rather that there's a, a trend towards collaboration, I suppose. So not rejection, but collaboration. And I think now more than ever, I think there's a resonance to what's happening in the world right now with the pandemic, with um, all of the cultural unrest, with the, with with our um, confrontation with social justice. That there is a, a trend that I think we as um, uh, uh, people thinking about business sustainability are, are looking at and coming together in both groups to make a difference, um, as well as build um, administrative tools and um, frameworks to support um, a, re a response. So that, there are many trend, other trends that, that I see, but I think that this is an important trend then why um, these are great tools and great conversations, but why it's particularly important right now um, and relevant to what's happening in the world right now. Yeah, I can maybe add to that um, sort of a different uh, dimension, because I think um, so what you were just describing, Alyssa, are some really interesting sort of more like macro trends. Mm -hmm. And I guess some of the, the patterns that I've been noticing that are much more like at the micro level inside individual networks. Um, one of them, I guess, Alicia also briefly mentioned around like centralization of uh, money and budget management and, and financial decisions. And I guess one thing that's interesting is that I've been working on the collaborative budgeting tool co-budget for quite a few years. So we've sort of been maintaining it. And through that, I've just uh, been in touch with so many different networks, co-ops, uh, all types of groups that get in touch and say, hey, we want a collaborative budgeting tool. Is this useful for us? And so many of those all say that they suffer this problem of uh, there being like a bottleneck around the budget and that just causing a lot of issues. And especially usually the people that are doing it that are often the founders or the leaders that they don't want to do it and that they sort of feel stuck with that responsibility but that they don't know how to distribute that responsibility. So that's something that I've heard again and again, and it still feels like uh, we're quite far from finding the right solution to that, um, but have lots of good questions. Mm -hmm. I wanna to totally agree. I, we see that as well. Um, people really do want to make a difference. Um, and I think it's important for us to um, build like systems where you're not like weighted by um, uh, weighted by the 
the budgeting, I, I suppose, and, and instead like empowered to, to make impact. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. Please, okay. I'm sorry. I could talk about trends all day, so. <laughs> That's fine. I just wanted to add uh, some more, so it's more like micro at, um, at a community or uh, network um, level. For me, there is some um, pattern. So it's not really trends what I have. It's more like patterns of um, scarcity. Although it's like we keep talking about abundance, but we keep finding ourselves in, in context in which somehow we kind of like recreate scarcity or are somehow like not able to uh, get out of that. Um, so that would be one thing. And um, then the other thing when it comes to money, uh, what I see a lot is this tension between wanting to um, split um, let's say budgets in, um, in an equal way, or at the other hand, going very meritocratic. And, um, and yeah, like both have advantages and disadvantages, and uh, we can go in those uh, maybe a bit later in more detail. But I do think it's very context um, dependent on where each, each scenario might make sense and um, the importance of making that explicit. And I do see somehow the other thing that I um, have as a pattern would be like talking about money. And I don't know if it's because of the networks I find myself in now in which like money is like a uh, bigger topic that we're trying to address, but there is some, I have the feeling as sort of like um, being aware that money is a tool and that we can use it for the purposes that we have um, chosen to. And so we have to deal with this issue as well. Yeah, I definitely feel like it's changing somehow that um, talking about money is becoming more common that there's something shifting and that makes me really happy because I do think that um, a lot of these like collective, collaborative, cooperative groups, like there's this default of um, splitting things equally. That's sort of like the starting point often. And I mm -hmm. think uh, that's being questioned more and more that that isn't like just the simplest, best way to, to do things. And that's quite, it reminds me actually, um, this is maybe a funny story of a one of the first participatory budgeting experiments we did in WeShare that sort of came off the back of a pretty dramatic uh, conflict actually um, at, a, at a retreat. But basically um, the proposal was that we had like, I think a budget of 10,000 euros or something like that. And we had um, 80 WeShare connectors at the time that was sort of like our governance members. And so we literally split the budget perfectly by all those people and I think each person I think it was less each person had like 186 euros to allocate um, and it was just somehow such a like extreme example of like everyone has this little bit um, and you know that first that first attempt at, at trying this and yeah since then it's really it's changed quite a lot um, and that's just interesting to see I guess. Yeah I think it's worth going into I'll pass to you in a minute Alyssa but Francesca, Joram's um, prompt or question in the chat, this yucky feeling around money, which I think um, we see a lot because money becomes a proxy for what am I worth? What is my value? And that's not necessarily related to what you produce in an economic context, but it becomes one of the only signaling, signaling powers that we have to say, you're really welcome here. What you're doing is helping. What you're doing is valuable. And I think that does cause yucky feelings. But do you just want to pick, pick that up, Fran, in relation to the comment you made earlier around feeling bad about this, this power that you gain from holding some of the money strings and then we'll keep moving? Oh, that seems like a, you're asking me for something quite deep there. <laughs> um, I think that, yeah, that probably in many of the, the groups that I've been in, we haven't really um, addressed yet, or that's starting now, the more psychological dimension of like what money means to you and what you're maybe projecting onto that. And I guess uh, one thing that's quite interesting is that a lot of the networks that I'm in, there's sort of this combination of volunteer work and paid work or people that are coming at it from a very like, um, you know, the way you volunteer for, for a nonprofit like uh, Caritas or something like that. And that would come and say, no, no, I'm never gonna get paid by this organization because there's a cause and it's not okay to get paid. Like, you know, money is evil and I don't wanna receive that. And then on the other hand, you have people that, you know, really sort of, uh, yeah, have a different approach to the, the mission and they wanna make it their livelihood because they love the work and it's their purpose. And so of course they want to get paid and they need to. And so I've often seen those two um, sort of personas really clash 
um, and there being like a lack of, uh, I guess, um, clear intention around what is this group actually about? And I think that's something that a lot of uh, communities and networks could uh, get better at being really intentional. Like, is this a place where we, you know, this is on the side next to the other stuff we do in our life? Or are we actually trying to make a livelihood? Uh, which connects a bit to, I think, also the topic from our, our last session. But it seems really important because I think maybe some of the, the yucky feelings that I was having when I was doing that budget um, back in the day was that there was this uh, gray zone of certain people. For them, it was really like their livelihood um, working in WeShare at the time. And so those budget decisions were decisions about their life and their income. And like, I don't feel comfortable making that decision, right? Um, and the real dilemma was often I would actually uh, try to bring in people to, you know, get their opinion and make the decision together, but people didn't want to. They said, no, 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 we trust you, you do it. And there was so much trust in me that I was like, no, no, I don't want that. Like, that's too much. It's, it felt like too much responsibility um, for something that would impact others a lot. I don't know if that answers the question a bit. And I think I saw someone was asking about a clarification in the chat that I guess, yeah, when we say budget, um, what I mean is just basically the, the document, the spreadsheet or whatever it is that allocates money to all the things that are needed um, to run the organization. So that could be salaries, that could be expenses, that could be many different things. Very nice, Fran. I think you nailed it. Um, and so do you want to finish us up on this and then we'll move to the next question. Uh, agreed. And if I, Fran, I think you said so many things on point to our, our work um, and, and vision as well. Um, one thing I, I just, well, two things I suppose I just wanted to, to say, one around the trends. Um, you know, our, my, my work is very much around like how we can create uh, technology innovation. And I have a passion for um, open source. I think um, when we come to like business sustainability, um, we there are a lot of lessons that we can learn from when it comes to open source technical uh, development that haven't been applied to um, the business uh, frameworks and sustainability. And so what I think is really exciting having been in the open source field for uh, my entire professional career, which is long, um, is that there's a growing acknowledgement of the importance of open source in most any um, uh, technical space. Um, there's increased research um, happening um, at a global scale, uh, whether it's through foundations or universities. There's increased um, uh, large contributions um, and creation from, from companies around open source and the sharing of um, and the transparency of technology development. And I think that that relates to this question um, that we no longer have to um, make a a, the case for you can do better work uh, together, you can sustain better work together. Um, I, I think that is growing to be um, understood and acknowledged um, in the technology field. And I think we are moving towards a place of like, how do we apply the, the lessons there, the values there to um, uh, fiscal you know, sustainability? Um, I think in that like space of transition, the other thing I wanted to, I don't know if this is a trend, but to I think the yucky question is like amazing because <laughs> there's so much yucky stuff that's happening um, uh, right now. Um, I'm sure for everybody, you know, personally and, you know, professionally and, and whether it's micro and macro. Um, I think what's, what's sad for me and somewhat yucky is that is, about age, like you see um, people working in these um, uh, creative, you know, alternative frameworks uh, for, um, for like business sustainability um, in youth. But at a certain point, you know, you get old, you have other responsibilities, you maybe your family life um, changes. And so different, you're, you're, you're confronted with different choices, maybe your health um, 
there's a change in your health and you're confronted with different choices. And I, I feel like something that makes me feel yucky, um, something that I think um, others feel yucky as well is that this space of um, uh, like, why, why, why is, um, uh, and I hate using the word alternative, but I mean, why are these um, non-traditional frameworks, why are they not as uh, valid a, um, a, a career choice um, than you know, signing up for a larger um, corporate identity? So um, I'm sure that makes uh, people feel yucky who make that choice and, and uh, to see it from the outside, it makes me feel yucky. Um, and I think it's a trend as well, like I think for as much as there's a trend towards collaboration, there's also a trend towards um, um, people moving to do this work um, in the framework of uh, large, large big tech. Yeah, thanks very much. And I'm it's a very good prompt from Joriam in the audience, this question of this, the yucky feeling. Um, around resources and money. I think it's uh, being picked up. So thanks, Joy. Um, and yeah, I think you made a good point there, Alyssa. It's how do we enable more people to work on stuff that matters in these alter with alternative frameworks and um, um, alternative financial models? And we're not even opening the huge can of worms that uh, cryptocurrencies and open source communities related to blockchain technology uh, give us, and I, I see a few members of the audience who are probably more experts on these subjects than us, like uh, Matthew um, and, and Julius and uh, Adam, but we won't go there tonight. Um, that's a very big topic. Um, I want to move us towards um, some, some solutions, some concrete solutions that you are seeing being applied to some of these, these trends or these problems that we just talked about. Are there any yeah, examples and stories that, that you've come across who have come of a network or community who have come up with a good solution to, to some of these problems that we are, we're talking about. Um, Alicia, do you want to start us? Um, yeah, um, although what I'm going to say is kind of like also related, well, I guess in this context, you might not be able to separate them with the challenges that are out there, but um, Recently, we were talking about, um, uh, Fran, I think it was yesterday, about this, um, and I mean, so there are these networks in which you, you have the livelihood, and now there are many networks in, in which there is like both, right? Like people making a livelihood, many people on volunteering, like both tasks being uh, mixed together. And then there is this like, how, how do you make strategic decisions that might bring in more resources if um, you're, you cannot, or it's very difficult as a network to align towards those decisions, like how does this prioritization happen? And I think that in this case, um, like greater than or other hybrids are like very interesting um, experiments to see how to make that happen. Because I haven't, like um, in Wisha, for example, we've been struggling um, forever and ever with this. And, uh, and, and, but maybe it's not in the design of it, of being able to do it in this way, but there are other designs in which this might be possible. And this might be a solution. So this might be also for me, uh, I would be interested uh, to know what you think. Uh, Francesca and Alyssa and, and people in the, in the audience about this strategy in networks and, and uh, prioritization and how do you do that, um, question mark for me. And then on the other hand, um, it would be about culture. So I think that um, we talk about systems and maybe as well some people that are more in the whole crypto space um, have um, more insights on how you design these spaces with uh, different incentive mechanisms. But I think as well that the, the solution for me or what I have seen um, or what I have a lot of hope with is this evolution in the cultures um, that we that we live in. And there I appreciate a lot, for example, the whole uh, work from Brene Brown on courage, uh, because I think that that's a key piece that I think that is missing in many of the systems that are being created, because I don't really believe that you can, you know, just um, have a mechanism solve this problem for you. It's a human problem. And for that, I think that we need to find these spaces of conversation. Um, the question, of course, to me is um, as well, like, how do you scale that? But, um, but yeah, I, I think that those sort of like um, practices that help us as human beings, like 
uh, step away from all of these uh, flight and fright and, and reactions and like uh, like bad patterns of conversations. I think that all the work that is being done in the moment um, can can help us a lot in how how to be together. And I have a couple more we'll jump on later. Yeah, it's really interesting that you mentioned strategy because I had also written that down and I feel like somehow, yeah, thinking about uh, money in networks and making decisions gets you to this question of, well, how do you do strategy in a network um, pretty quickly? And it does feel like one of these sort of big unsolved questions. And I guess one, one thing that I guess I've sort of been playing with, uh, sort of, we sometimes call it like emergent strategy, which maybe seems like a bit of a paradox. <laughs> so like strategy that just sort of happens rather than something that's been uh, predefined and is then executed. But I guess, uh, what I think is interesting is to try to find a way to connect on the one hand uh, spaces for a group to do strategic thinking together and then have a place where people can take action uh, in a sort of independent decision making level. So just to give you one example of that, and these are really just micro experiments, so it's not that far along yet. But we've doing, been doing this a little bit with, uh, with co-budget and, and like collaborative funding processes. Uh, which is that, for instance, we did this in the Inspiral Network uh, about, I think this was a year ago now, and we recently did a mini round in WeShare too, where basically we held spaces for um, people that were interested to come and do strategic thinking and really like sit with the question of, okay, we have a certain budget, what would we like to do with it? Like what would be strategic? But really just uh, staying in the space of strategizing, discussing, and just, yeah, thinking about it. And then you have a, a tool like CoBudget or any other thing that you could use um, where basically each individual has the power to allocate funds to certain objectives or to certain proposals. But basically uh, each person can, can decide all on their own. And what I think is really interesting about that is that you sort of have the strategic reflection and then the individual action and that that doesn't force you to have to somehow get everyone in a room and get everyone to agree and, and get a consensus on a strategic direction. And what, I, what I've also noticed is that it's almost like it becomes a little more like um, mobilizing people in a movement, but you're doing it inside the organization. So like if many people are a fan of doing a certain thing, you just need to like excite enough people um, to then make that strategy happen. So it's, uh, yeah, it's much more emergent and distributed and, and maybe it's really tiring because you have to sort of, uh, you know, win people over one after the other, but it's sort of like the, the total opposite of having a top down strategy and saying everyone has to do this now. So yeah, those are just sort of some things I've observed um, that have happened or how I think we've done strategy in these kind of contexts or how strategy has emerged. Awesome. And I'm seeing lots of questions and comments coming through in the chat, which is cool because we will move to a bit more of a Q&A with the audience in a minute. But first, I want to pass to Alyssa about what are some concrete solutions that you're seeing um, through your work with Open Collective, um, things you're noticing? I mean, what I love about what you said, uh, Alicia and Fran, is that um, so kind of different than how I interpreted the question um, uh, and uh, now I want to introduce you to like a, a million people. Um, so I, I w w what I saw as solutions um, is that from where we sit at the open um, source collective space, the open collective foundation um, space in that flow is that uh, we, we support and give guidance around how um, a, a team might develop strategy. Um, but then we're the, again, like the administrative mechanism to um, uh, be that collaborative funder. So uh, one of the slides that I wanted to highlight was the work of Open Web Docs. Um, open Web, and I'll put the, the link in the chat, but Open Web Docs um, mission is to create um, good technical um, documentation. Um, recently, in terms of another trend, those departments, um, those initiatives have been cut by um, a lot of um, a lot of um, 
companies that were traditionally supporting that. So this is open technical documentation that allows others to, to learn and participate like in the like digital economy. And so um, a consortium of companies um, and, and individuals, so both big and small came together on the open source uh, collective platform and decided to um, fund uh, writers to make this um, make this technical documentation, and this was a solution to a a you know at at certain times companies are making um, decisions that uh, you know don't necessarily empower or benefit um, the the ecosystem um, and the larger community that we sit in, and so even other parts of those organizations um, want to come together and work together in order to um, invest in like collaborative spaces. And so again, and we'll put the link in the open web docs, but um, the this kind of collaboration of, um, of stakeholders, both big and small have raised like close to a million dollars in order to um, again, um, support technical documentation. Um, I think another, uh, there's a lot of experiments like in my world world towards solutions and another experiment, again, we'll link to it, is this uh, matching campaign that we're doing um, that's um, kind of taking um, or scaling something that's um, used successfully in the Web3 space um, that's called quadratic funding, um, something that has raised $11 million in the quad to support open source projects in the Web3 space. We're applying that to the Web2 space. And so it's a, essentially a matching program where if many people happen to, or, or we, design it. So if many people um, vote on a project, it's matched um, at a higher like multiplier than if one person uh, voted for a project. So if 100 people um, contribute $100, that's matched higher than if one person contributed $100 to another project. And so I, I again, I feel like there's a lot of really interesting solutions um, to and and like work around um, trying to create different frameworks for um, financial sustainability. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and Kate, oh, Kate, here, yeah. No, go ahead. Did you oh, yeah, I see you added a link uh, in the chat and that's exactly, you know, uh, in part what we're talking about. Cool. So there are some good questions coming through and I might just because we've got 14 minutes left, uh, utilize my power as the host and facilitator to take a couple of the questions and uh, match them with the speaker, given my um, the context that I have. So we have one from Brian, which Francesca, I'm keen for you to, to, to answer, which is, I'm curious what your favorite icebreakers are to get into money as a topic in a collective context. Happy money game, et cetera. Yeah, icebreaker is an interesting word in that context. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly what it is. Um, I mean, there's some really fun exercises that we've been doing with groups around money. And I think like there's a, a really easy one that may, maybe that is an icebreaker, which is just that you basically uh, take a stack of post-its and you get the group around and you just ask people to shout out to them what money is or to take post-its and write themselves and just basically like do popcorn for like, you could go on for an hour, but basically, you know, do like 10 minutes of just uh, people saying what money is to them. And you end up with like this huge, like sea of different post-its with so many different things. Uh, usually many, many uh, like opposing words, right? Like um, money is responsibility, money is risk, uh, you know, money is opportunity, like lots of different things. Um, and to me, that's that's a really interesting, just like simple, quick thing to do that really um, makes people super aware, like in one second, uh, how how many things money can represent uh, to different people and in different uh, situations. So it sort of shows you the depth of the topic in a very quick moment. And um, I think one other one other fun thing, which is probably not quite an icebreaker, but it's actually called the the money game, it was uh, developed by the Finhorn community. 
and we've actually we've we've run quite a few of them and have also now a colleague who's done them online so we're quite curious to to try this out but it's actually a game that you play with real money uh, and it's all about sort of investigating your personal relationship to money and doing lots of uh, reflection in between the game and uh, we've actually played it in quite a few different contexts with our communities over the last few years and so uh, I definitely can sort of add on to what Alicia was saying about the the sort of cultural side is that I do think that uh, we've managed to get a lot of the groups we're in to just start talking about money much more and like take the taboo away a bit, um, which just there's always a big, a big barrier at first. And uh, I think games like this can really help open up the conversation. And just a quick clarifying question from Sandra. Is that the same as the happy money story? No, that's something else. Um, so yeah, the happy money story game, which is probably why it's confusing because it also has the word money game in it. Uh, that's more like a, a process that you use to distribute a budget that you have or to, to figure out, you could also use it for how someone's gonna pay a bill at the restaurant, for instance. Um, I don't know if I should explain it again now, but yeah, well, we can send you a link that explains that in more detail as well. Cool. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask Sylvia in the audience, you put a great question through about personal growth. Would you be keen to take off your mic um, and ask that question to our guests? Sylvia. I guess you took, yeah. Oh, of course I can. Great. Yes. So yeah, I'm just wondering, I mean, the discussion that you had before, it really brought the question up for me whether all these discussions about money and you know what what it means and how it can be shared how it should be shared etc even the strategic discussions like what are we going to do with a certain amount of money whether that's actually not a question of actually the growth of each of us individually and as a collective needing to happen in order for us to be able to do that so really an underlying aspect that needs to happen first, I guess. I wonder. Yeah, thanks so much. What do you think? Alicia, do you want to start? Mm, I think um, in my experience, like I'm, I'm not a, a psychologist, so, um, but in my experience, it, it needs to go um, together with, with the collective, right? Like I think that in the settings in which we are, um, you need to find this bridge. And, um, and it's about, yes, it's about the personal growth, but based on what system that you're co-creating together, like what are the yeah, like and I'll put it um, with an example. As I saw your question, I was thinking of, um, and I think it was your question. I we were talking about fear, the saboteur, scarcity, all these uh, these things. And yeah, um, that's the one. Yes, uh, and I, as I was reading this, I was thinking about um, um, a book um, or something that Jung Caporta, um, uh, and I think uh, Kate, you can help me here. I think uh, you read it too. Sand talk. And he's talking about these cultures that um, that nowadays we have a problem because we do not um, have cultures that regulate narcissists. For example, it's like you know that you can have free riders, you can have all of these things because we're not holding <laughs> space together, and we're but um, that in indigenous cultures there is a very strong uh, way and culture to go around this, and then like what you develop uh, is it's able to do that. I think. It's, you know, it's like, you have to know what are those shared rules and how do we develop together? It's not that you go and do your personal growth or finding, I think, and then you go to the group and it works, right? It's, it's, it's this exchange that happens that you kind of like regulate um, the system and what's okay in one context might be completely different in another one. So I, I think that, yes, it's personal yeah. growth, but it's completely related to the growth yeah. of the group and the culture that you build. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that, I guess this is sort of a tension that I'm really feeling at the moment is that it seems really clear that um, doing this personal work alongside all the other work is really important. Um, but at the same time, somehow 
uh, it makes me feel a bit uneasy because uh, it, I guess it just makes me wonder uh, to what extent we can expect everyone to be doing this and what are sort of, I guess that's why I'm so interested in culture because in a way that's where you codify at a deeper level um, certain practices and mindsets. And that means that not each of us has to go through this like very laborious work to uncovering all these things. It just seems uh, quite unrealistic that everyone's gonna, gonna do that for so many different reasons. Uh, so I guess that's just sort of a question I'm sitting with because um, I guess one example is even with some of the customers that we work with, we try to take like a, a value-based approach to our pricing. Um, and even just going down the path of explaining that and wanting to engage with them on this topic of thinking about money differently, like it just brings up a lot of questions and it suddenly, um, you know, brings up things for the other person that maybe you didn't expect and that you're going to have to start uh, working, working with or working through. Uh, and that's quite a heavy, heavy load. So that, there's a lot of questions I have around that, I guess. Yeah, great question, Sylvia. Um, it feels like we're really getting into the heart of the matter here with six minutes to go. So thanks for bringing that. Um, and yeah, really good reference, Alicia, from the book Sand Talk, which perhaps, Alana, you could drop the link in there. I'm sure there's a lot of fans of this book in the audience. And I think it connects really nicely with the, the work from David Graeber on the anthropological uh, interpretation of value, which is also another beautiful read. Um, and also debt the first thousand years, 10,000 years. <laughs> um, so we're running out of time. Um, we will stay around for 10 minutes after just to, thanks, I don't know, 5,000 years, um, to have a chat, take mics off uh, if you can. Um, but let's, I think we've got time for one more question. Oh, we've got a lot of long ones coming through. Adam, I'm, I'm not even... I can't actually read that right now. We'll go back to one um, earlier from Matthias, which is, um, I'll try to rephrase if it's okay for you, Matthias, just to get it a bit shorter. Um, what is this balance between exploring these new ways of dealing with money and persisting with the way you have found? Um, anyone wanna, Alyssa, I know I asked you to take this, but does anyone feel, yeah, wanna go? Yeah, and I'd love to hear others on this when I hear the word persisting I I hear the word sustaining and so how do we um, collaboratively sustain um, ourselves and uh, the the work that um, we we envision and um, this is at the core of um, both the inspiration of, of how we um, formed as a, an organization um, and uh, I think it isn't fully solved. Like, how do you sustain um, these business models? Again, sustain yourself uh, and sustain like the technology innovation that happens um, uh, because be because of all this. Um, I I think it's important. Um, uh, for me, I feel like we are in a space of advocacy um, and advocacy to that we are all collectively responsible for. Um, the success um, of ourselves and the the work that we create that it's not um, that it's not a it, and it never has been like an individual um, but that we work in community um, and so this generosity to creating like business models that are based on like generosity and collective action um, is something that. Uh, like I, I aspire to. And so, you know, I want to take an MBA program that teaches me how to be, um, how to f work with uh, money and, you know, and financial success um, through uh, a, a collective, um, you know, framework. So um, I have no idea if I answered any of that, um, but it, at least I, I tried to like speak from um, it's a space of sustaining together um, rather than competing with one another. Yeah, I would maybe just add on to that, that I guess uh, you do somehow have to pick your battles with this kind of stuff in the sense that it just isn't, a, it won't sustain yourself or your group to try to change everything at the same time. Um, 
but I do think that uh, rethinking the financial element is so powerful and it's so like deeply ingrained that, you know, maybe if you've sort of uh, evolved or changed all the, art, the parts about how you organize, except that one, um, I think it might hold you back quite strongly. So I guess, um, yeah, I personally think that the, uh, the, uh, the impact of playing with the lever of, of how money and value flows is, is very high um, for the, the effort you could put in. Um, and it's actually interesting because one organization we're working with right now, they decided to jump straight in and really focus on changing how they do salaries. And like, it's really hardcore, but um, it also, it takes you quite far when you really go for it. So I think it's an interesting one to focus on. Fantastic. Okay, so we are at one minute to the hour. Uh, we have to wrap up. Um, there's been some amazing yeah, conversation tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Alyssa. Francesca and Alicia for coming on to the Greater Than Talks, um, Thriving Networks, The Money Problem. And this is, we are currently prototyping and about to launch um, a course called On This Subject uh, on the Greater Than Academy. It's currently oversubscribed, so, but we are taking um, applications for the next cohort. If any of you are really keen to go in and deeply explore these questions even more with us and many more frameworks, models, um, business models for networks. Um, and yeah, it's gonna be a good time. I think some of you are coming along already. But um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us, um, speakers and, and guests. It's been a really, really cool session. Yeah, and thanks, was... thanks Kate for, for hosting us. And thanks uh, Elena for the silent tech facilitation in the background and the con collecting all the great links you've been sharing because we'll, we'll make sure to share those back. And the cat. <laughs> cool. Um, and we will stay around for 10 minutes um, and try to, uh, Alyssa, feel free to jump off, but if, you're, if you can, we'll try to answer some more of these um, other questions. Yes, and we do have, right, we have one more of these coming up. Well, actually two more already scheduled. So our next one, I think, is going to be in a few weeks now, in three weeks, about pitfalls of self-managing teams. So uh, if you like this, maybe see you at our next ones. Very good point. <laughs> thanks, Fran. Cool. Thanks, everyone.